Have you ever known someone that made a false judgment about another person? Well, actually, we do this a lot as human beings. It has been said that a human being makes a judgment about another person within a mere seconds. And sometimes that judgment will become solidified within their mind and it will stay for a lifetime. They say that false judgments say more about us than it does the other person. And it's true. We don't know the other person. We only know us. And it is the opinions that we're holding inside of us that really make the difference about our feelings about another person. When we point at a person, remember three fingers are pointing back to us. It says more about us than it does the other person. Let's look back at history on some of the incredible false judgments that have been made. There was a six-year-old lad that came home from school and he came home with a note and the teacher said, this boy is no good. He's too stupid to learn anything. He needs to be taken out of school. That boy was Thomas Alva Edison. Alfred Tennyson's grandfather gave him 10 shillings for writing a eulogy for his grandmother. And after he read it, he handed it back to the lad, and the old man said, Well, from what I can see, this is the last money you're ever going to make from writing. You don't have any talent at all. Benjamin Franklin's mother-in-law hesitated in a big way to let her daughter marry a printer because there were already two printers within the United States and she judged that the country might not be able to support a third. In 1933, there were writings about Adolf Hitler that said he's a nobody, he will never amount to anything. In 1865, the Chicago Times judged Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And in print, this is what they wrote. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, the flat, the dishwatery utterances of a man that has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. You know, it's kind of unbelievable how we, as individuals, and as a society have misjudged in the past. Daniel Webster, the great scholar and spokesman, didn't believe in railroads. He said railroads will never work. They'll never be able to get something that heavy moving on tracks. And then he said if there's any frost on the tracks, why the whole locomotive would come to a stop. <laughs> in 1865, in Concord, Massachusetts, the home of Thoreau. Do you know that they banned the book Huckleberry Finn? The very smart people of the town judged it as trash, suitable only for the slums. In 1929, in Russia, they blacklisted Sherlock Holmes for its disgraceful conduct in writing. They said that it should never be on the shelves of good homes. In 1939, in China, they banned Alice in Wonderland. They judged that animals should not be able to use human language. It's disastrous they said, to put animals and human beings on the same level. If we think about society today, who is the one judge in a society 
that is not a judge. Do you know who it is? It is the baseball umpire. There was one time when Babe Ruth was thrown out of a game. And he walked up to the umpire and he said, Ump, there are 40,000 people here in the stands who all know the truth that I am not out. The umpire looked at him straight in the eyes and said, Well, that may be so, but mine is the only opinion that counts. When we judge another person, when we make a false judgment of someone and then hold that judgment throughout our own life, we say the same thing. We say, well, it doesn't matter. Mine is the only opinion that counts. I have a little plaque on my wall of my home. It says, not my will but thine be done. Imagine if we transferred this to judgment. Not my judgment, but God, your judgment be done. We are going to be brave enough to go inside of our own minds and look anew as if for the first time rediscovering that some of these verdicts that we've handed down throughout our lifetime in our past, down on people and situations, we're going to be strong enough to say maybe that was wrong. We become willing today in our spirituality to turn it around. Hembry wrote this, I dreamed of heaven. I dreamed death came the other night, and heaven's gates swung wide. With kindly grace, an angel ushered me inside, and there, to my astonishment, stood folks that I had known on earth. Some I judged unfit, of little worth, Words rose to my lips, but were never set free, for every face showed stunned surprise. No one had expected me. This is the story of Michelangelo. He went one time to a rock quarry, and when he was standing in that rock quarry, he saw a certain big piece of rock. He got it, but the person who owned the quarry said, No, no, you don't want that piece of rock. It's no good. It's not worth anything. Michelangelo said, Well, if that is the case, I want a discount. Well, he got a discount. When he took the rock home, those that he passed said, you just can't do anything with that particular piece of stone. And he said, you judged wrong. There's an angel trapped inside that stone. They looked at it. They walked around it. They said, there's no angel in there, not in that piece of rock. He said, you wait and you will see. He brought the angel forth from the stone that nobody else wanted. I think about that a lot. When I am tempted to judge someone that I may not like in the moment, I see that person, and in my mind I walk around them, and I say, you know, this is just an old piece of rock. And then a voice inside of me says, oh no, there's an angel trapped in there. I may be the only one that can let her out if I so choose. And if I do, inside of my mind, there will be a masterpiece. 
I would like to share a story with you that Richard Reagan wrote. He wrote this story at a time when he was sitting in a restaurant with a lot of his friends. There was good conversation, everybody was happy, and the restaurant was right on the town square. Everything was fine until they looked out the window and saw a bum come into town with a knapsack and all of his worldly belongings on his back. He was holding a sign that said, I will work for food. All the people in the restaurant looked out the window and said, what is this? Well, this man is up to no good. We ought to call the sheriff. After all, he doesn't belong here, not in our town. They sat around, <clears throat> and even the ones who were members of a church group sat there, and the conversation shifted. 100% to judging this man, this man that they didn't even know, who was outside the window in the town square. Just last Sunday, the preacher had talked about judging. Richard decided, well, maybe the preacher was right. As he went out of the restaurant, he got into his car and he had a a nagging feeling. Have you ever had God give you a nagging feeling that you should do something? The minister said that we should look into people a bit more. And if we would question in our own minds, we would find something there, something to love, if we took the time. The minister said, often we have a file cabinet up here. And it is a file cabinet of gray mass. And we find someone, we form a judgment, and we don't just put it in the file permanently, but we shut the file and then we put crazy glue around the edge and we make sure that it is sealed tight, never to be changed. Then we put our file cabinet with our sealed judgment, the sealed fate of that person. We close it, we lock it, we padlock it, we put crazy glue around the outside, and we bury it deep in the recesses of our minds, and we don't even remember the original judgment. But oh, how it comes back, bubbling up to give us opinions of that person and other people that we deem are like them. Well, Richard decided he was going to go beyond. He was going to listen to what the minister said on Sunday. And he went over, and he actually talked to this stranger. Now, he was hesitant because he still judged the man. He thought perhaps this man would harm him. He found the man where he was standing on the stone steps of the church on the town square. And he talked to the gentleman and he said, are, are you looking for the pastor? The man said, no, not really. I'm just resting for a moment. And Richard said, have you eaten today? The man said, oh yes, I ate something this morning. And Richard said, now, would you like to have lunch with me? And the man said, do you have some work for me to do? I'll be glad to work for my lunch. I'll do anything. No work, Richard replied. You just come with me. I would like to get to know you. So they went together to the restaurant where the people had judged this man so harshly just a few minutes before. They sat down at a table and it was as if every ear was listening to the conversation to see if they could find out what this stranger was about. They listened as he questioned, where are you headed? St. Louis was the answer. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from all over, but mainly from Florida. How long have you been walking? Everybody in the restaurant listened. 
They couldn't believe the answer. Fourteen years was the answer. Richard sat there and he stared at the man and he realized he had met someone very special. Someone that he didn't expect to meet. Someone his eyes had not told him about. And then the man unbuttoned his coat and on his red t-shirt was printed, God, the never-ending story. Daniel's story began to unfold. He told about where he had been walking for 14 years, all in the service of God, and how he had stopped in Daytona Beach 14 years earlier. It all started there. He said, I was a drunk. I was a drug addict and an outcast of society. He saw some people raising a tent. He thought it was a circus. And he went over and said, could I have some work? They said, sure, we'll put you to work. Well, it ended up being a tent revival. During the evenings, he would listen. Listen intently. He wouldn't want to, but he would listen anyway. He listened, and he started to realize his life, the way that he was working it, wasn't working. And he decided to give his will over to God. And that night, he became a new man. He said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And God said, keep walking. Keep walking and find people to help. Say an encouraging word and give them a Bible. He concluded, that's my story. The entire restaurant listened. They were shocked with the incredible, the, the eloquence that flowed out of this man's mouth and the wisdom and the deepness of his soul. They also noticed beyond what their eyes had told them in the beginning. There was an energy coming from this man and it was love that just filled the whole place that everyone could sense and feel. They wanted to be close to this man. So they ate lunch and the whole restaurant enjoyed his company. And then the question was asked where he was going right now. And he said he had been told in prayer that it was his time to go to St. Louis. He said somebody there must need a Bible. And he will meet them on the road because God will arrange the meeting. Richard said to the man, would you like a Bible to add to your backpack? I'll get you a Bible if you'd like. And the man said, oh, that would be very nice. I can always use an extra Bible. They went into the bookstore and found just the small type of Bible that the man liked to carry and give away. And then the time came for the man to depart, and they stood there in the town square, and it started to rain. Richard, at this point, realized that his life had been profoundly changed in two hours of time. That there was a presence that radiated from this man and the mission. And he realized, he sensed, and he loved something that he was in contact with. And he said to the man, how long has it been since... Anyone has given you a hug. The man said, it has been a very long time. Richard said, would you be threatened if I hugged you? And they embraced there on the town square like two brothers departing. The man said, I love you. And Richard said, I love you too. As they were departing, the man turned around and waved and said, God bless you. Richard shouted, God bless you too. The man walked a little further and turned again 
and said, If you ever think of me, will you pray for me? Richard said, Oh, yes, I will. I promise. Richard went on to work, and when he left work at five o'clock that evening, he had noticed that it was starting to get dark. He noticed that there was a cold wave that had been blowing into town, and with it, a fresh, brisk breeze. He opened the car door, and he sat down in his seat, and he moved back, and he looked down at the emergency brake to release it, and he noticed two old, worn work gloves in his car. And he thought about how cold it was, and he hoped that the man could keep his hands warm in some way. And then he realized that this was a prize gift. If I found something of this man, or about this man, Every time I look at it, I will pray for him. Well, that was 23 years ago. And Richard now keeps those gloves on his desk. Every time he sees those gloves, he will remember the touch of this one person and what it does in a person's life. And also something much more important it reminded him to be an active prayer partner, that he will never judge again with snap judgment, that he will give the benefit of the doubt to everyone. He will take the time to know someone and, more important, take the time to love that person. It's a wonderful story and a true story. How much our lives can change if we release the padlock on our judgments. If we go the extra mile. If we don't get just locked up in our snap judgments immediately. Sometimes when we don't, we can find the best friend that we've ever had in a lifetime. By connecting with them. Or perhaps a soulmate. Or perhaps a wonderful marriage. If I had the time, I'd tell you times that I know about where people have married someone that at first they despised. And then they got to know that person and <laughs> everything changed. As you watch a magician saw a woman in a box in half on stage. Your eyes will tell you that there is a woman there that is being sawed in half. As you watch the magician put the blades down in the box all over from all the sides, your eyes will tell you that there is a woman that is being hurt on stage right in front of you. The only reason that you don't get up and rush onto the stage in front of thousands of people is your mind is also telling you that this is an illusion. You have a connection with your mind and eyes. If your eyes were to rule, well, you'd be up there. You'd be on stage saving that woman no matter what it took. Our mind is connected with our eyes and we stay in our seats. We have to tell ourselves that no matter what it looks like, this is an illusion. Sometimes when we make a snap judgment, we need to have that connection with our eyes and our minds so that we can constantly tell ourselves this may not be what it looks like. This may not be true. We take time spiritually to discover the truth. For centuries, we believed that the earth revolved around the sun because it looked that way to our eyes. We had to have proof as a society 
that this was not the case. We still stand and everything revolves around us and yet to our eyes it looks quite different. To society, through eons of time, it looks different. When we realize this, we realize most of our world is not visible to our eyes, audible to our ears, or to our touch. The fact is that most of the universe does not exist in a three-dimensional world, but exists beyond our physical senses. This is exactly where the things that matter most in your life exist in your spiritual journey on the dawn of this new day of discovery. I'm going to ask you a question. Where is kindness? Is it there on the town square? Is it right in front of you on the stage? No. Kindness is not in the three-dimensional world. Where is love in your life? It is beyond the three dimensions. Where is God? It is beyond the three-dimensional world. Everything that matters is beyond what we can see and beyond what we can touch. The real magic in your life is invisible to you. We just have to be brave enough to find it. So often, when we judge another person, it is like setting the margins on a word program. Sometimes we set them in very close. And when we do that, it is like blinders on a horse. We can only see what we choose to see. Even if it's seen wrongly, we can't expand our view and see the real view of that person. Your lower human mind. Your lower human mind can be like a bad neighborhood. You should never go in there by yourself. Call God to go in there with you. This is the area where we can hate and even where we can kill. We kill people with our ideas inside of our minds. We write them off and seal the file once and for all. As a spiritual person, it should not be that way. As God's children, we should open up the file and let in the breath of the light of day. Today, as a society, we are still judging through our foundations. And we have this foundation of human mind that dictates that we should feel this way or that way from what we've learned in life. And yet, the whole foundation of our country should be the foundation of what we feel spiritually inside of our own minds, and that is innocent until proven guilty. We must not be part of the jury and we must not shout the verdict on every person we meet. We are not inside of our lower human minds a court TV where we're looking at people and saying, well, this person, look at that person. Look at this person over here. Look at them. I know people that actually amuse themselves by doing this. I wish, as spiritual people, we could rise and be fascinated in a new way, a positive way, with our lives. I pray that we 
see things in the best view that we could possibly see them in. That we no longer see ourselves as a critic, but as a praiser, as someone that is constantly looking for and seeing the good and finding the good in other people. I pray that instead of a critic, you become a coach. You say, now, that may not have been done correctly, but you can do it better the next time. Because I believe in you, and I believe in God, and everything is going to be okay. When you treat your employees like this, when you treat your family members like this, when you treat your friends like this, but perhaps more important as you walk through life and treat other people silently by your opinion of them in your mind like this, you're going to have a much better life. In Matthew 7, 1 and 2, Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, will you be judged? The measure you give will be the measure you get back. We know that God is love. God is not sitting here with a tally sheet on you, adding up what's right and what's wrong. God is loving you. So, when you are judged in the moment, when you judge another, you say more about you than you do about the person you judge. That is how you are judged in the moment you judge. And when you free yourself up spiritually, the whole world can open up to you. New friends, new acquaintances, new wonderful bonds of friendship that will last a lifetime. I know because it's happened to me. And I know because it can happen to you. Jesus continues. He says, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, Neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? He says, You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly how to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Saying the same thing. It is saying the problem is with the one who judges, not the one that is judged. When you are not using righteous judgment, you have not taken the time and you have come to a very, very fast conclusion. A special speaker came to a church and he stumbled all over himself in his talk. His thoughts were disconnected. It was not a great lesson. And one of the neighbors said that was there hearing this for the first time in this church. He said, well, he said, I don't think that this man should be allowed to talk to you or to me. I think it's a disgrace that our time was taken for this man to us. It is terrible, and I'm going to complain. I'm going to see to it that the powers that be uh, are going to never bring back a person like this anymore. Because this was just a lousy talk. And he said this in the hallway in a loud voice so everyone could hear his judgment, his opinion, and what he was going to do to fix the man and fix the situation. 
And then he was told gently and with love that this man cared so much for us that he came in to speak even though that very moment he had been told that his own son had been killed in a traffic accident. He cared so much for us and he had so much love for us that he wanted to be there even though in his grief he could hardly stand up. He just wanted to be there to give to us. The man stood there in the church hallway and it changed the man forever. It changed him away from his snap, false judgments. He said, from now on, dear God, I swear I'm going to know the facts first. I'm going to know what I'm talking about before anything ever comes out of this mouth. And hopefully before any opinion forms inside of my mind. It has been said that what you do not see correctly with your eyes, don't invent with your mouth. Another old saying is, there is no need to burn down the barn to kill some fleas. Many times, we have just a few things that we don't like about a person, and then, what do we do? We set fire to the entire concept. As children, we judge everything to be our parents' fault. We blame it on our parents, and later in life, we blame it on others. It's their fault. And yet, it goes back to Jesus' words about judging another person and taking, instead, personal responsibility. We have to look in the mirror and say, wait a minute, I'm going to take the log out of my own eye so that I can see clearly. A critic is someone who thinks that they know the way, but they can't drive the car. You have seen signs and you've seen license plates reading God first. I have seen this statement several times in, in several states on license plates, bumper stickers. That is supposed to be the core of our belief, putting God first. What does that mean, to put God first? How do you actually do it? Well, God is love, so you put love first. Religion is not just a Sunday morning thing. As good as that is, we must move beyond churchiality to personal spirituality. Spirituality is something that you have within you every minute of the day. And you have to have it with you in the restaurant on the town square. You have to look out of the window and, and put God first instead of putting your own lower human mind first. You think you know even though you're a stranger, I'm going to go beyond what I know. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to say inside of myself, I love you and I accept you for who you are. Do you know over time, everything changes and life becomes a, a freedom and a bliss. That person out there in the town square has no idea that you've changed your concept of them, but you know because you have changed. You have found a spiritual secret to happiness. For those judgments, that you have made and I have made in the past, 
Here is what I'm going to ask us to do. Visualize in prayer the opposite of the judgment. In other words, unlock the file. Open the file. Even if you have strong glue on it, get a glue remover. You know the ones that you've judged in the past, that you've been holding on to for a lifetime. They, the interesting thing is they don't stay in the file cabinet. They grow larger over time. I'm asking you to be brave enough, brave enough to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to take the action, to open up these files and look again. This time, instead of saying, ha, I was right all along, you say to yourself, no, this is not the way it is, and I'm going to visualize the opposite. What if you say to yourself, and then see yourself making the absolute right judgment? You remember God first. You are agreeing to go the extra mile with God's help, and with God's teamwork, and with God's partnership. And you're going to love this person, even someone from the distant past. The higher your opinions of others, the higher your opinion of yourself. Join me in prayer. This day, dear God, I ask for your help. I know God that I am under your law of divine justice. The law of divine judgment always works to perfectly equalize and to harmonize and to establish equality and order for all. Dear God, I refuse any thought or belief that negates this truth. I hold firm to my faith in your power, God, and in your justice. I have a deep and abiding feeling of peace and of well-being. God, I am under your law of divine justice, and everything in my life, God, proves the working of this law. I thank you, God. I place you first, God. I place love first in my life, now and in the past and in the future. In Jesus Christ's name and nature, we pray. Amen.